all had the opportunity to learn a little bit of the Hakdama, the opening words of the Sefer Chavetz Chaim tonight. I think it's, I always love learning the Hakdama of the Sefer Chavetz Chaim because it's such a good refresher. I find even more important than going through all the halachas is just putting the halachas of Lashon at the forefront of our minds helps us to realize how much of reality it is and sometimes realize how, much, how often we speak and don't realize that we're speaking. Before the Chavetz Chaim was the Chavetz Chaim, it was February 6, 1838, the 11th of Shvat, and Yisrael Meir Cohen was born. He wasn't yet known as the Chavetz Chaim because he hadn't written it yet, so he was just born. Um, later, when he wrote the Chavetz Chaim, which is about Lashim Hari, he titled it after the Pasuk in the Hill and the verse in the Psalms, Miho Isha Chavetz Chaim, who is the man who desires life, the Chavetz Chaim translates as desires life. Oh, Yom and Liros Tov, who loves these seeking good, that was that first paragraph that we saw. What's life? What's about desiring life that Hashem wants to give us a great life? What's the etza? What's the advice that the Pasuk gives? Is the Tur L'Shom Chameira. Don't speak bad about another person. Isn't that amazing how our religion, with all of our 613 mitzvahs that we know encompass every single second of our day, that the Pasuk tells us that if you want life, the secret to it is, just don't speak bad about anybody else. It's that simple. I, it's, I don't know, it's mind-boggling to me every time I think of it. The Chavetz Chaim is possibly the most famous of, the, of, of Rabbi Soameir Cohen's works, arguably between that and the Mishnah Bura, I guess, depending on who you ask. Um, the Mishnah Bura is um, a six-volume work explaining the Shulchan Aruch, and it's till today, it's basically... <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's used in every single base on When I was in the mirror, at every single corner, they had a set of Gemaras, a set of Rambams, you remember that, Shlomo? And a set of Mishnah Buras, <laughs> all together, that was like... All together. But these are not the only works that the Chavetz Chaim wrote. The Chavetz Chaim, this is a Kol Kisve Chavetz Chaim. It's all the entire set of the Chavetz Chaim. His works include Chavetz Chaim, Mishnah Bura, Shmir Salas Shon, Ahavas Chesed, Machin Yisrael, Teferis Adam, sorry, it's going to take a while, Gedar Olam, Nidcha Yisrael, Shem Olam, Chumas Hadas, Lekute Halachas, Yiboras Ari, Taras Yisrael, Torah Skanim, Asifa Zikanim, that's three volumes. Cholas Hashmira, Torah Sabayis, Zecher Lemiriam, Beis Yisrael, the Sefer HaMitzvah HaKatzer, he only did the mitzvahs that were relevant nowadays, and Sipis Ali Yeshua. That good? <laughs> How's that for an impressive collection of words? I'm not going to spend the evening going through a, a whole historical background of the Chavetz Chaim. <coughs> it, it is another worthwhile endeavor. My goal tonight is to try to understand a little bit about this incredible human being and what made him who he was. How did he accomplish so much, the, these, the tremendous amount of works that he wrote and delivered to Kali Sol, to the Jewish people? He built a yeshiva as well, and he's known until today, besides for the Chavetz Chaim Heritage Foundation and the yeshivas Chavetz Chaim that are named after him, there are, I mean, Neri Sol that I was in before is also named after him. There are yeshivas all over the world that chose to name themselves after the Chavetz Chaim and follow his model. So who is the Chavetz Chaim, and, and how can we understand that? What did he? What was his approach to life, and what can we gain from him? So first, I just need to start with one very intense story that I found very interesting. And when he was 17 years old, he was an eligible bachelor, and everybody was interested in the Chavetz Chaim, and anyone who had a daughter was interested, and if they had wealth, so they were offering dowries, and if they were rabbis, they were offering rabbinic positions. But he, whatever he was looking for, he had it. There was one man who was interested in the Chavetz Chaim as a son-in-law, but he was not a wealthy man. That man was the Chavetz Chaim's stepfather. His, his father passed away when he was young, and his mother's husband wanted him to marry his stepsister, who was older than him. And his mother thought it was a terrible idea. They themselves were not a wealthy family. They were living in poverty, and why should he continue that his whole life when he had a great future in front of him? And there were issues developing the marriage, <coughs> their arguments about whether the Chavetz Chaim should marry his older stepsister. Chavetz Chaim's brother even came home to try to convince a man of it. The Chavetz Chaim says, he said, no, I'm going to do it, and he did. He married his stepsister. They lived a very long and happy life together. Well, not too long, actually. She, she, she passed away and he ended up marrying his second wife. But they did live a nice life together. And the legend has it that the reason why he did it was in order to end the Sean Bias issues, the marital issues that his mother and stepfather were having over this argument. So I, I was blown away when I, when I read that. There's one story that I want to focus on that I really think that this story really 
summarizes and cap and encompasses the entire everything that I've read and looked up and researched about the Chavetz Chaim. The Chavetz Chaim had a granddaughter who was very enlightened. She was going to college. It's in that generation, that was not a common thing. You know how my father is always so impressed that his mother went to college, and this is, you know, in the early 1900s. And she wanted her grandfather to be more in touch with reality. So this is a quote from her that she said to her cousin, Rabbi Hillel Zatz. I'm going to read it from you. It's the translation, I guess, from Russian. When I was 18 years old, I left home and went to university. During a, during a visit to my family, I went to visit Zadie, grandfather, and told him, Zadie, why are you sitting in the dark? Come into the beautiful world of technology. See the beginnings in, in, of this revolution. It's a beautiful world out there. What did Chavetz Haim respond? This is a, a continuation of the quote. Zadie pointed to an airplane flying by and told me, you see those airplanes? During World War I, they used to throw a box of dynamite out of the window of a plane to kill people. Someday those airplanes are going to reach the moon. And those bombs, they're going to create bombs that will be able to kill the entire world. He was right. With all of their enlightenment, that is what they make. But inside it is dark. And inside, we make men. The sense of the Chavetz Chaim is incredibly profound, and I really think it summarizes his entire life. Inside it is dark, and that's where he wanted to be, and inside we make men. Chavetz Chaim insisted his whole life to live in the small city of Radin. If you look on a not Jewish map, I don't think Radin would be on there because it was that small. There was dirt paths the whole way through. The homes were dirt floored. Only until his family insisted that he get wood flooring, I think they installed it without telling him, that's when he finally had wood flooring, and when he would go to a home without wood flooring, he'd say, wow, a home without wood flooring, I love it. He didn't understand any, any fanciness. He was a very simple, very humble man who lived always in the simplicity of the dark. He was offered positions as a rub in many cities, uh, lucrative positions as a rub, and he always turned them down. <clears throat> One time he couldn't, the funny story is, in the town that he lived in, Radin, when they asked him to be the rub, he, he was in a bind because how could he turn them down? I mean, he's the greatest Talmud Chacham that there is there and probably in, in, in the entire Jewish people. And he felt like he owed it to his city. So what does he do? <laughs> How could he turn them down? So he felt like he had to accept. But he was always looking for his way out. At one point, a, a halachic court case at Dintor came to him. And the, the two sides presented, the two parties presented their sides. And he passed in the favor of one side, thus the other side was obligated to pay. And the guy says, well, I'm not going to pay. So what does a rub do when somebody is... I don't know, is this called Masar of Lebastin, right? He's Masar of Lebastin. So what do you do? You do a cherem, or you figure out what to do to get the guy to... Chol Tzayim said, okay. He called the town meeting, and he says, I'm sorry, I have to resign now. I'm done. If you don't want to listen to me, then I'm not the Rav. And he, he got out of his position of Rabbanus, which is fascinating. He was so not interested in any position of prestige or honor that he just, he didn't want it. Um, and finally, when he first published the Sefer Chavetz Chaim, he refused to have his name printed in it. So quiet, so humble, so interested in being not known, he didn't write his name in the cover page of his safer, let alone on the cover, which everybody does now. That was the Chavetz Chaim. He, like his granddaughter said, it's dark in here, and he said, yes, inside it's dark. But the end of his statement was that inside we build men. What did the Chavetz Chaim do to build men? So first of all, we discuss Mishnah Bruh. Now, the concept of Mishnah Bruh was a tremendous, tremendous asset to Kali as it still is today. Basically, Shulchan Aruch is complicated and shorthanded, as we all know. And the commentaries of Shulchan Aruch are also very complicated. And it's very complicated, as we're seeing in the Kolo, dealing with different opinions, seeing who to take, what not to take, what to follow, when to be machmer, when to be mako, what do you do? Chok Tzayim took everything, and he made it simple. The goal was that even the, any layman can open up a Mishnah Bura, and halacha could be relevant to him. That he doesn't need to go asking around and feeling incompetent. No, he can relate to the Shulchan Aruch. He took the words of Shulchan Aruch and he made a commentary there. The goal of Chavetz Chaim was to build people. We talked earlier and we learned earlier from Sefer Chavetz Chaim. The Sefer Chavetz Chaim was a brilliant innovation in his time. We don't realize it because we're, we have so many Svarim that come out now. But originally in Kaiso, authors, what did they do? They learned through Gemara. They had Chidushim. They wrote them. They learned through Chumash. They had Chidushim. They had insights. They wrote them. They took their learning and they made it available to the public. That's how Jewish publication was done, religious publication. The Chavetz Chaim, on the other hand, 
He said, I see an area that needs, that the Jewish people need to grow in. The Jewish people are not following the laws of Lashon properly. So he innovated a concept of let's create a Sefer on a specific topic, which is very rarely done before then. He said, I'm going to make a Sefer on Lashon Hara. The Gedolim of that generation were blown away. He was young. They said, who is this guy? He just created a fifth version of a Shulchan Aruch. This is amazing. That comes from a person who's interested in building people. I'll tell you what I was really impressed by, though. Learning about the Chavetz Chaim, and this is true about all of his farm, but it really, it really impressed me by two. I put them at the end of the packet. I don't know if anyone, everyone had the opportunity to get there. One is the Sefer, Nidcha Yisrael. I put on the cover page to Nidcha Yisrael. Nidcha Yisrael is a Sefer written for people who were intending to move away from the Jewish community. So first, the, the beginning of Nidcha Yisrael explains to them about the downside of moving away from the Jewish community, how difficult it will be to live. And then he explains about how to keep halacha when you don't have the backing of a community with you. Isn't that amazing? Somebody who's so concerned about the Jewish people as a whole, he says, what am I going to do about the people who don't live with us anymore? Who's going to help them? So he wrote a, a, a sefer to help them. Machne Yisrael, that's the next one. Machne Yisrael is a sefer written for young men who were drafted to the army, to the Russian army. They were in their teen teenage years. They weren't competent yet in halacha to be able to, to know what to do fully in every area. So he wrote a sefer specifically to them, designed to be specifically for them, in order to be able to keep halacha in the army. We talk about building people. Chavetz Chaim was concerned, not just that the Jewish people should know what to do, like a sefer like Mishnah Bru, that's for everyone, but a sefer like Nidhe Yisrael and a sefer like Machne Yisrael that are directed for specific groups that he was worried about. So we go back to the quote that the Chavetz Chaim said to his granddaughter. He said, inside it's dark. And the Chavetz Chaim, it seems like a, a combination that doesn't go. He lived his life in such seclusion, in such darkness, in such quietness, in such humility. Inside it's dark. He says, yes, but inside we build people. How does that go together? Why is it specifically Dr. the Chavetz Chaim, who lived his life in the dark, that he was able to see the whole world? That he was able to see the Jews moving far away, and he was able to see the Jews going to the army. Why is it after the Chavetz Chaim, specifically the Chavetz Chaim, said, I need to make a safer that says everyone shows them how to relate to the Shulchan Aruch, that they can learn it themselves. Why is it specifically the Chavetz Chaim, who lived his whole life in the dark, that he's able to do this? Without elaborating too much, I think the answer is, is, is simple. That the Chav, when, you, when you go to the outside world, the Chavetz Chaim tells his granddaughter, they make planes. And soon they're going to make a plane that goes to the moon. Because they're in competition. If someone's going to make a plane and you go out to the big enlightened world where everybody's looking at what everyone else is doing, so, you, so someone has to un, over, outdo the next guy. It's like every record is eventually going to be broken. But I think somebody even beat Michael Jordan's jump from the free throw line. I don't know if that was everybody's. I, to me, that was like, like whatever. <laughs> Vince Carter tried doing it. He was like an inch short. But whatever. Somebody beats every record eventually. Because if you try hard, you can do anything. But in the world of enlightenment, it's about competition. So if it's about planes, it's going to be about reaching the moon. And if it's about bombs, it's going to be about killing the world. How great an accomplishment is that if you can kill the world? And that's the world that we live in. We're all terrified of all these countries that have that, that have bombs that can, that can do such terrible things. But when you live your life away from that, when you live your life away from the bright lights, away from the competition, and you focus inside, and you focus on yourself, and you focus on what's really important, then you're able to focus on what's really important. And you're able to concentrate your energies on good, important things, like seeing the Jews who are going to the army, what's going to be with them. You're able to worry about people, not worry about yourself. I think that's why the Chavetz Chaim, I think it, that story really beautifully sums up his entire life. Chavetz Chaim says, yes, it's dark inside, but inside we build people.